Good day everyone, today we will discuss some of the important soil chemical properties such as the cation exchange, the anion exchange, the base saturation, and buffering capacity. Let us first discuss what is cation exchange. Cation exchange is a process in which positively charged ions in soil solution leave the solution and attach themselves loosely to the solid phase, which has a net negative charge. At the same time, cations and the solids enter the soil solution. This process is the best understood mechanism of nutrient retention and release for plant growth. Now this figure illustrates how cation exchange process is happening in the soil. When you say exchangeable cations, those are the cations loosely held on the surface of the clay mineral that can be replaced easily by other cations on the soil solution. So in this illustration, you can find the ions of calcium, magnesium, and sodium that are adsorbed on the clay surfaces. And these cations can be are replaced or exchanged with aluminum, potassium, and hydrogen ions that can be found in the soil solution. In most soils, 99% of soil cations can be found attached to micelles. So those micelles are the clay particles and the organic matter. And 1% can be found in the soil solution. So in the arrow, you can see that is an illustration of a clay particle with attached or adsorbed cations such as the calcium, magnesium, aluminum, and sodium. And this is the arrow for the soil solution where you can find the, also the ions for potassium, calcium, and hydrogen. Now, the soil solution is the water surrounding soil particles which contain dissolved minerals and salts. So, as you can see, cation exchange is not only happening between the soil solution and the clay particle. It can also be between the root hairs or the plant roots and the soil solution and or the clay particles. Cations in the soil maintain an equilibrium between adsorption to the negative sides and solution in the soil water. And this equilibrium produces exchanges. When one cation detaches from a site, another cation attaches to it. And the negatively charged sites are called cation exchange sites. What is the importance of cation exchange? Why are we studying cation exchange? Number one, it's because the exchangeable cations are being made available to plants, supplementing the small quantity in solution. And also, those cations are retained in the soil and not lost with leaching water. Another importance is that cation exchange at negative sites is major retention mechanism for heavy metals such as cadmium, lead, and zinc. Now we are moving on with the characteristics of cation exchange in soils. Number one characteristic is that it is reversible. For example, you have this sodium ion adsorbed in the soil colloid and hydrogen ion present in the soil solution when the exchange can happen to the right. Hydrogen ions could be attached or adsorbed in the colloid, and this time the sodium is in the soil solution. This process um, could be reversible. It can happen to the right or to the left. Hydrogen ion replaces the sodium ion, and the reaction will go to the left if sodium is added to the system. Another characteristic is that it is stoichiometric. 
meaning there is proportion of exchange. Um, it is in cons consideration with the charge equivalence. And the exchange is chemically equivalent. It takes place on a charge for charge basis. An example is that one calcium ion, calcium 2 plus, will replace two hydrogen ions. Meaning, um, there should be a charge equivalent, or it should be chemically equivalent. For example, uh, one magnesium ion, magnesium ion is magnesium 2 plus, will replace two hydrogen ions or H plus. Another characteristic is the ratio law. It is following a ratio law. For example, calcium 2 plus and magnesium 2 plus. At equilibrium, ratio of calcium 2 plus to magnesium 2 plus on the colloid will be the same as the ratio of calcium 2 plus to magnesium 2 plus on the soil solution. For example, this ratio for calcium is to 1 magnesium. So, this is an example of the chemical reaction. There is um, 20 calcium 2 plus adsorbed in the colloid and 5 magnesium 2 plus present in the soil solution. When exchange, uh, cation exchange happens, it should have the same ratio um, against or compared to the previous one before the exchange process begins. So, um, the ratio would still be for calcium is to one magnesium. Another characteristic is that the reaction is instantaneous or there is a quick reaction. Clay minerals with one is to one lattice tend to have more rapid rate of exchange than two is to one clays, which have both internal and external exchange sites so as you can if you can remember when we study or when we discuss about one is to one clay minerals such as the candides or the most dominant or prominent example of candide is the kaolinite now the exchange rate is more rapid on those one is to one clay colloids than those that are two is to one like the Mount Morillionite, Vermiculite, and Elite, because these two is the one clays have both internal and external exchanges on the interlayers. Just a little known fact about um, calcium 2 plus and magnesium 2 plus, or the ratio of the two. Calcium to magnesium ratio determines how tight or loose a soil is. The more calcium a soil has, the looser it is, and the more magnesium, the tighter it is. At high calcium, soil will have more oxygen, drain more freely, and support more aerobic breakdown of organic matter. While at high magnesium, soil will have less oxygen, tend to dry or drain slowly, and organic matter will break down poorly, if at all. If you have a heavy clay, the ratio is normally or commonly 70% calcium, 10% magnesium. If we have a loose sandy soil, there is 60% calcium and 20% magnesium. And if ratio is just right, there could be no problem with soil compaction. Remember, the higher the magnesium content of the soil, the soil will be more prone to compaction. Now let's take a look on the rules governing cation exchange in soil. For rule number one, highly charged cations tend to be held more tightly than are those that are less highly charged. This follows this lyotropic series, where in this lyotropic series describes the relative strength 
of various cations adsorption. You can notice that in the lyotropic series, that those are those cations that have high high charge are more tightly held than the less highly charged. For example, aluminum three plus is more tightly held than the calcium two plus, magnesium two plus, and those calcium two plus and magnesium two plus are more tightly held than. K plus, NH4 plus, sodium plus, and deuterium plus. That's for rule number one. Now for rule number two, small cations tend to be held more tightly and are released from the exchange complex less easily. So if you look in this table, this table has selected ions and ion characteristics. You have the ion, the charge, dehydrated residuals, atomic weight, and equivalent weight. So on the column for iron, we have calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, hydrogen, and oxygen. For the charge, for calcium and magnesium has uh, have plus two charge, sodium and potassium has have plus one charge including hydrogen. Hydrogen also has plus one. While oxygen has negative two charge. Um, notice their hydrated ratios. For calcium, it has 0 0.300 nanometers. Magnesium has 0 0.400 nanometers. Sodium has 0.215 nanometers. Potassium has 0.115 155 rather um, nanometers hydrogen has 0.455 nanometers so based on the charge if you can remember the leotropic series calcium and magnesium are more tightly held than sodium potassium and hydrogen of course oxygen will not be Adsorbed on the exchange complex because it has a negative charge. So we are just talking about the cations here, those that are positively charged. So comparing calcium and magnesium, they both have plus two charge. But the question is, um, which is more tightly held on the exchange complex, the calcium or the magnesium? Now, based on their size, calcium is more tightly held in, in our, ex, our exchange or are replaced on the exchange complex less easily. Because um, calcium's hydrated ratios is smaller than magnesium. Now, another example, let's take a look on sodium, potassium, and hydrogen because these three both have plus one charges. Now, among these three, potassium is the smallest based on its hydrated ratios. Now, we can see, or we can say that potassium is more tightly held than sodium and hydrogen because it has a small, smaller hydrated ratios. Now, for rule number three, regardless of the size or charge, cations that dominate or are present in large concentrations the soil solution are favored in exchange solution. So right now, we are talking about the concentration. For rule number one, we are talking about charge. For rule number two, we are talking about the size. But now, we are talking about concentrations. For example, in very acid soils, very acid soils will have high concentrations of hydrogen and aluminum ions. So those um, ions, hydrogen, such as the hydrogen and aluminum ions, will be favored in the exchange uh, reaction because they are present in large concentration. In neutral to moderately alkaline soils, calcium and magnesium ions dominate, while in poorly drained iron soils, it may absorb sodium in very high quantities. So based on the soil's pH and the soil's drainage or water holding capacity, 
you can see that um, you can notice that certain cations dominate so because they are present in large concentrations they will be more favored in the exchange reaction now you may have notice that cell pH has something to do also with the cation exchange process as soil acidity increases pH decreases more hydrogen ions are attached to the colloids and push other cations from the colloids and into the soil solution. Therefore, the cation exchange capacity decreases. Inversely, when soils become more basic, meaning to say pH increases, the available cations in solution decreases because there are fewer hydrogen ions to push cations into the soil solution from the colloids. Therefore, CEC increases. Now, cation exchange capacity or CEC is the sum of positive charges of the adsorbed cations that a soil can adsorb at a specific pH. Or in other words, it is the total capacity of a soil to hold exchangeable cations. And this cation exchange capacity can be expressed as centimoles of positive charge per kilogram of oven dry soil. So we have the unit of centimole P plus per kilogram of soil. Earlier unit was MEQ or milli equivalent per 100 gram soil. So uh, if you happen to read some references having MEQ per 100 gram soil as the unit for CEC, it's just the same with centimol P plus per kilogram of soil. Um, there should be no conversion. So for example, um, 20 centimol per kilogram soil is just equivalent to 20 MEQ per 100 gram soil. Now, the exchangeable cations that are most important in the soil are the following. We have calcium 2 plus, magnesium 2 plus, sodium plus, potassium plus, and hydrogen plus. So, another is the aluminum 3 plus. Cation exchange capacity is an inherent soil characteristics and is difficult to alter significantly. It influences the soil's ability to hold onto essential nutrients and provides a buffer against soil acidification. So when we say essential nutrients, we are talking about the essential nutrients for plant growth. It is a very important soil property influencing the soil structure, stability, nutrient availability, soil pH, and the soil's reaction to fertilizers and other ameliorants. For example, soils with a higher clay fraction tend to have higher CEC. Organic matter also has a very high CEC. The CEC of a given soil is determined by the relative amounts of different colloids in that soil and by the CEC of each of these colloids. For example, sandy soils generally have lower CEC than clay soil because coarse textured soils have lower uh, content of both clays and organic matter. So in this table, you can see some examples of CEC values for different soil textures. For sands that are light colored, they have 3 to 5 CEC. Sands that are dark colored have 10 to 20 CEC. Loams have 10 to 15. Silt loams have 15 to 25. Clay and clay loams have 20 to 50 CEC, all 
with a unit of MEQ per 100 gram of soil. You can notice that in these examples, as the soil texture becomes finer, CEC increases. Take note of that. Now, CEC is used as a measure of the soil's fertility, nutrient retention capacity, capacity to protect groundwater from cation contamination, and CEC is the measure of how much negatively charged sites are in the soil. So, meaning to say, the higher the CEC of the soil, the better it is for plant growth because the higher CEC means more fertility and more nutrient retention capacity. In terms of protecting the environment, especially the groundwater, higher CEC is uh, desirable because it can protect the groundwater from cation contamination. Now, what soil properties determine the magnitude of CEC? So, our properties that determine the CEC are number one, texture. Clay soils have higher CEC than sandy soils. So, as what I've said earlier, as the soil texture becomes uh, finer, CEC increases. The amount and type of clay mineral, so clay type, which is predominantly Montmorillo unitic, has higher CEC than a kaolinitic clay. Why? Because Montmorillo Lunitic has two is to one clay minerals, while Kalinitic only has um, one is to one um, clay colloids. So, because of the interlayer space, um, the more negative charge or more negative charges are present in the two is to one clay than those that are only one is to one. Another is the organic matter content. The higher the organic matter content, the higher the CEC of the soil. That makes sense. So if you can remember that humus is our organic colloid. And that organic colloids are, or those organic colloids are negatively charged. So organic, the more organic matter content, the more humus content, therefore, the higher the CEC. In contrast to CEC, we also have AEC, which is the anion exchange capacity. In contrast to CEC, AEC is a degree to which a soil can absorb and exchange anions. AEC increases as soil pH decreases. Because the AEC of most agricultural soils is small compared to their CEC, mineral anions such as nitrate, and chlorine are repelled by the negative charge on soil colloids. And these ions remain mobile in the soil solution and thus are susceptible to leaching. The common anions in this soil are chlorine, Cl minus, nitrate, NO3 minus, sulfate, SO4 3 minus. Phosphate, PO4, T minus. And the anion lithotropic series is H2PO4 minus is greater than SO4 minus 2, greater than NO3 minus, greater than Cl minus. That is phosphate, greater than sulfate, greater than nitrate, greater than chlorine. Right now we are finished on the CEC and AEC. Let us now move to base saturation. This is some history. From 1920s to 1940s, Dr. William Alberts and his associates experimented and concluded that the strongest, the healthiest, and most nutritious crops were grown in a soil where the soil CAC was saturated to about 65% calcium, 15% magnesium, 4% potassium, and 1-5% to sodium. So that's the Albrecht's ideal ratio, the ratio of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium, which is 65, 15, 4, 1-5 respectively. 
This saturation refers to the amount of the CC that is occupied by the basic cations such as calcium, potassium, magnesium, and sodium. The portion of the CEC that is occupied by acidic cations, primarily hydrogen, aluminum, and iron, is called the exchangeable acidity. It can be expressed as a percentage and called percent base saturation. In other words, it is the proportion of acids and bases in the CEC. The higher the amount of exchangeable base cations, the more acidity can be neutralized in short time perspective. The concept of base saturation is important because the relative proportion of acids and bases on the exchange sites determines a soil's pH. As the number of calcium and magnesium ions decreases, and the number of hydrogen and aluminum ions increases, the pH drops, or the, the soil becomes acidic. And adding limestone replaces acidic hydrogen and aluminum cations with basic calcium and magnesium cations, which increases the base saturation and therefore raises the pH. Now, in relation to base saturation, let's uh, take a look on the buffering capacity of soils. Buffering capacity is the soil's ability to maintain a constant pH level during action on it by an acidifier or alkalescent agent. Meaning, the higher the cation exchange capacity, the more cations can be supplied and the higher the soil's buffering capacity. Now, let's take a look on how to measure and estimate the cation exchange capacity. CEC can be estimated from soil texture and color. For example, in this table, we have different soil groups having different soil texture and color. Light-colored sands have 3 to 5 CEC. Dark-colored sands have 10, is 10 to 20. Light-colored looms and silt looms uh, contain 10 to 20 also. Dark-colored looms and silt looms contain 15 to 25. Dark-colored silty clay looms and silty clays have 30 to 50. While organic soils has more than 50 CEC. So notice that as the soil color becomes darker, the higher the CEC. As the soil texture becomes finer, the higher the CEC. And the higher the organic matter content, the higher the CEC. The CEC of the soil also is usually measured by saturating the soil with an index cation, such as sodium ion. The removal of the excess salts of the index cation with a dilute solution and, and then displacing the sodium ion with another cation. So this method is usually done in analytical service laboratory. And the amount of sodium displaced is the me then measured and the CEC is calculated. Now this is a sample problem and the calculation of CEC. So, for example, in determining, determining the CEC, 25 gram soil sample was saturated with ammonium acetate to replace all cations with ammonium. After distillation of the ammonia, it was found that 0.07 grams of ammonium was adsorbed by the soil. This time, we, we use um, NH4 plus or ammonium to replace or displace all the cations adsorbed on the soil. Now, how to calculate CEC from this data? To calculate the CEC from the data, you have to know the atomic weights of the 
um, nitrogen and hydrogen. Why? Because that is, uh, uh, those are the cations that are present on the ammonium. Or the cation that is used for displacement. For nitrogen, you have 14 and for hydrogen, you have 1. Now, let's calculate the grams per mole of ammonium. And calculate it by just summing up the atomic weight, uh, atomic weight of the two. So, 14 plus 4, you have 18 grams. Now, in calculating CEC, remember that the unit used is usually centimole per kilogram. So, in, right now, we have gram per mole. So, we'll just have to convert it to grams per centimole. So, just divide 18 grams by 100, you'll have... 0.18 grams per centimole. So, we can now calculate the CEC to have a unit of centimole per kilogram. So, based on the data, you have 0.07 grams uh, adsorbed ammonium per 25 grams of soil. Let's multiply it with 0.18 grams per centimole of, uh, of ammonium. And also, um, divide, it, divide it by 1,000 grams to get the kilogram unit. The answer would be 15.56 centimoles of ammonium per kilogram soil. Now, since you, uh, we calculated uh, the amount of the CEC of ammonium, which displaces all the cations present in the soil sample. And that value is already the answer for the total CEC of the soil. So the CEC of the soil is now 15.56 centimoles ammonium per kilogram of soil. Another problem really in relation to CEC or an added method in calculating CEC is when you have the uh, data on the percent clay and percent OM, organic matter content of your soil. So, in calculating the CEC, when you happen to have the data on the percent clay and percent organic matter of the soil, you can just assume that the average CEC for organic matter is 200 centimoles per kilogram. While for the average CEC of percent clay, that is 50 centimoles per kilogram. Now, remember that when you say clay, it could be montmorillonite, smectite, kaolinite, elite, um, chloride, or organic colloids. I rather inorganic colloids. So remember those five. So, uh, on the data, we don't know right now what kind of uh, clay colloids we are talking about, but we, we, we can just safely assume that the average CEC for percent clay, regardless of uh, what is the dominant clay for the soil sample, is present. Uh, you can just um, use the average CEC as 50 centimoles per kilogram. So the formula for the CEC by in, in using the percent organic matter and percent clay is this. CEC is equal to percent organic matter times 200, that is the average CEC for organic matter content, or for organic matter rather, plus percent clay times 50, that is the average CEC for percent clay. So, from soil data, for example, you have the data from the laboratory on, on OM and clay content. So, in this example, we have 2% organic matter and 10% clay. So, to calculate CEC, you just have to plug in the data. We'll have 200 centimoles organic matter times 0 0.02, that is from the 2% organic matter in the soil data, 50 
times 0.1. That is, 0.1 is the percent uh, clay, 10% clay. That is why it is 0.1. So, performing the calculation, that is 4 plus 5. The answer now for CAC is 9 centimoles per kilogram. Now, let's take a look on more sample problems. For the first problem, soil analysis showed that a 500 gram soil sample contains the following exchangeable cations. We have 0.75 centimole for sodium ions, 0.59 centimole for potassium ions, 4 centimole for calcium ions, 2.20 cm for magnesium ions, 0.75 cm for hydrogen ions, and 0.47 cm for aluminum tree. So, the calculate the following. CC of the soil, present the saturation, amount of exchangeable calcium in kilograms per hectare, assuming that the weight of the soil per hectare is 2 million kilograms, and exchangeable sodium percentage. So let's answer this one by one. The CAC, we have the following data for the cations, that is uh, 0 0.75, 0 0.59, 4, 2.2, 0 0.75, uh, 0 0.47, Centimoles. Remember uh, those cations that are mentioned from the previous slide. So these are the values of um, the CEC per um, 500 gram or half kilogram of soil. That is 0.5 kilogram. Now the unit for CEC is centimole per kilogram, meaning one kilogram. So how to answer this? Just multiply all those centimole values by 2, so you will have the unit of centimole per kilogram because 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 kilogram is 1 kilogram. So 0.75 times 2, you have 1.5. 0 0.59 times 2, that is 1.18. 4 times 2, that is 8. 2 times 2, that is 4.4. 0 0.75 times 2, that is 1.5. And 0.447 is 0.94 centimoles divided by 1 kilogram. So the answer for CEC is 17.52 centimoles per kilogram. Now, summing these values all up. For the base saturation, that is percent BS, you just have to sum the bases and divide the value of the answer into the CEC value, multiply it to 100. That is 1.5, 1.8, plus, rather 1.18, plus 8, plus 4.4. That is the centimole per kilogram or CEC values of sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium ions divided by the total value of the CEC, 17.52 multiplied by 100. The answer would be 15.08 divided by 17.52 times 100. For base saturation, we have 86.07 percent percent base saturation. Now, for the next problem, we have to calculate the um, exchangeable calcium per hectare, the amount of exchangeable cation per hectare that is in kilograms per hectare. So, the CEC of calcium is 8 per kilogram. So, just multiply it by 0.20 grams per mole. Remember, we have to calculate the amount of calcium per hectare. So, Multiply it by 2 million kilograms of soil, that is the weight of the soil per hectare, and then divide it again by 1,000 grams. So the answer would be 
3,200 kilograms of exchangeable calcium per hectare are present in the soil. Now for the ESP or exchangeable sodium percentage, you just have to perform this calculation or this formula that is sodium, exchangeable sodium divided by the total CEC times 100. So plugging the values, that is 1.5 divided by 17.52 times 100, the answer for exchangeable sodium percentage would be 8.5. 56%. Now, another sample problem. Calculate the CEC of a soil containing 3% organic matter and 20% cement type. So, this is just um, similar to the, pro the previous problem we have, wherein the given data is about organic matter content and clay content. But this time, the specific clay color is being mentioned that is a smeg type. So, in assuming the average CEC of, of the two, we all know that the average CEC of organic matter is 200, but the average CEC specifically for smeg type clay colloid is 100. Uh, if you can remember, the average or assumed average CEC of clay percent uh, clay colloid is 50, but now it is being specified that is 100. So, plugging the values on the formula given, that is CEC is equal to 0 0.03, that is coming from the 3% organic matter, times 200, that is the assumed CEC of organic matter plus 0.2 that is coming from the 20% clay times 100 that is coming from the assumed average um, CEC of SMEC type. The answer would be 26 centimoles per kilogram of soil. So that's it. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned from this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this.